Okay, so like I said, thank you for joining us on a Friday. We're glad that you are all able to attend the waiver review Skype meeting. Uh, the period that we're covering today is year three of our waiver, and we are in quarter three. On today's agenda, we are going to provide some HOPE waiver status updates, including um, an update on our new services, structured family caregiving, community living home, community transition services, um, and then an update on the EAA, or Environmental Accessibility Adaptations Policy. We are also going to do a quick overview of the waiver review process because we haven't um, done one of those for a while, so we just want to kind of remind everyone what that looks like. Um, and then we're going to jump into um, the waiver review committee recommendations and updates for quarter three of year three um, under each of the areas, administrative authority, the level of care, service plan, and health and welfare. So as um, most people are aware, we have been working on implementing a um, few new services, the first of which is structured family caregiving. And so we just wanted to kind of give an update. We had um, provided a kind of a one-page guide a couple weeks ago, I think, and now have updated the policy. Um, it's gone through the policy work group and will be shared and updated on the internet following today's webinar. Um, there were um, some updates between the time that that guide was released and um, we've identified some maybe some more efficient ways of doing a few things, so we just wanted to talk quickly about those. Um, so there was an update made to the referral and pre-auth workflow section to reflect differences between um, a new referral for structured family caregiving services to someone who hasn't been on the HOPE waiver before, so a brand new person, or a brand new person to waiver anyway, um, and someone who is currently on the HOPE waiver uh, who is transferring from an other waiver services, such as an in-home service, to the Structured Family Caregiving Service. So we identified that there are some differences in those processes, so we just wanted to um, separate those a little bit. Um, so some of those primary differences would be um, involving the home care assessment. So it would only be necessary for a current participant if there hasn't been one completed in the last 60 days. Um, so if there hasn't been a home care assessment for a current HOPE waiver participant completed in the last 60 days, you would need to copy and update um, the home care assessment. And the primary reason for that is that we want to make sure that that rate tier is correct um, when submitting that to the uh, Structured Family Caregiving Oversight Agency. Um, there's also some differences with the care plan. So basically, obviously, with the new HOPE waiver participant, you would need to complete a new care plan um, versus updating the care plan with an addendum if there's someone who's already on the HOPE waiver. And kind of the same thing with the cost of services. If it's a current participant, you would just need to update it, um, including the, or with the addition of the structured family caregiving, and then make, making sure that you remove any of the services that were previously authorized services that aren't allowed under structured family caregiving services. So for example, if the person was receiving the homemaker service, it's not a um, allowable add-on service with structured family caregiving, so that would need to be removed from um, the care plan via the addendum as well as the cost of services, and really, I guess, any pre offs as well. Um, and then the MRT process is a little bit different for um, an existing waiver consumer versus a new consumer. And then there were also some updates made to the prior authorization entry for the therapy pre off um, specifically addressed on the next slide. So, we identified again that there were some potential issues with the way we had outlined it in the guide. So the process that um, we have included in the policy, um, basically with this, the pre-auth, the LTSS specialist will create a new pre-auth in Therap and save it. So you wouldn't approve it at that point. And the reason for that is we don't um, we don't want the Structured Family Care Giving Oversight Entity to have a pre-auth without the prior authorization number um, because they aren't able to bill without it and, and then they have issues with that. So if you just save it, um, the, the provider will not get the pre-auth, which will give us an opportunity then to um, get the, pre or the prior authorization into the pre-auth. 
So next, the LTSS specialist will contact Rhonda Burris, who is our business operations specialist, and request a prior authorization number to be added to the saved structured family caregiving pre auth and therapy. The business operations specialist, Rhonda, will then review the level of care on the eligibility file, so in the MMIS SW95, um, and other information on the pre auth to ensure that it's correct. So she'll look at the level of care to make sure it's a B, um, and she will make sure that all the setup, the number of days, and those types of things within the pre auth are correct. Um, then she will add the prior authorization number to the description box and she will submit the pre-auth back to the specialist. She will notify the, the specialist when the prior, authoriza prior authorization number has been entered in the description and then the LTSS specialist will approve the pre-auth in therap so it will then go to the provider with, all of the, with the prior authorization and ensuring that the level of care is correct so that the um, provider can get their claims paid and that everything else is correct in the pre-auth as well. So some of the reasons that um, we made this change in addition, like I mentioned, the, the provider agency um, will not have denied claims because of the level of care, um, will not have a, a um, pre-auth without a prior authorization number. We're hoping too that it's less work for the specialist um, with Rhonda adding the number directly so there's not quite as much back and forth. Um, so those are kind of the reasons for that change. Are there any questions on the Structured Family Caregiving update? Okay, uh, next then we will go on to Community Living Home. So just as a reminder, the Community Living Home um, is a residential service that offers HOPE waiver participants the opportunity to receive services and supports in a small licensed home. Um, so up to four people can reside in this setting. The service is designed to provide an alternative long-term care option to persons who meet nursing facility level of care and whose needs can be met in a community living home. The goal of the service is to provide the participants with the opportunity to remain living in his or, his or her community while receiving the necessary care and supervision. Um, so the only update we really have in this area is that um, in a meeting with the Department of Health, we were notified that they had received their first application for a community living home um, in the Rapid area. So we feel like this is at least some progress towards this service. Um, however, it, of course, that does not guarantee that they'll become an LTSS provider for this service um, because that would just be application for licensure. So um, after the Department of Health reviews the community living home to ensure that they meet their standards um, and gets approved as a community living home, the provider would still need to um, enroll as a Medicaid provider, um, have a, a review to determine compliance with the HCBS settings review, um, a Medicaid approval application in order to actually become a provider for LTSS. Okay. But we are still happy for this news. Yes, we are. Yay. Um, <laughs> before moving on, I just wanted to note, just in case somebody's not watching the conversation in the Q&A, uh, Barb and a couple of the Sioux Falls staff are, are creating a, a checklist for the Structured Family Caregiving Service. So I believe if I remember right, she said that that would be coming out um, very soon. So be looking for that as well. And as I'm thinking about it, I'm working on a, a press release and some updates to our website for the Structured Family Caregiving Service. So I'll also notify everybody once those are done. Okay, and then the final um, newer service is the Community Transition Services, and we have been making some progress with these. So again, um, these would be services that would allow um, an individual who's um, residing perhaps in a nursing facility or even in assisted living to um, get some assistance with transitioning to a less restrictive environment. So for example, um, a nursing facility maybe to an assisted living or an assisted living to um, their own home and um, we would provide them with some um, community transition coordination to assist in um, developing some goals and strategies to ensure a successful transition, and could also include um, community transition supports, which would be things like 
um, purchases of the rental deposit or um, household appliances, linens, sheets, those types of things that someone needs to um, successfully transition to their own home when they've been out of it for a while. Um, so as far as updates with this service, um, we are currently completing some pilot transitions and we've actually had one successful transition, so that's a, a big win for that service. Um, and then we have three other transitions in progress. So we're working with kind of a um, group of people. We meet regularly with the provider and the staff that are involved in those transitions. We just want to make sure that we kind of get all the kinks worked out before we make that um, service available statewide. Um, and then once we do that, we will, of course, um, provide some additional updates policy um, release and those things. We are working on um, policy revisions based on kind of our lessons learned during the pilots just to make sure we kind of have everything hopefully um, in order to make the um, process for that service pretty clear. Um, so like I said, more information and final policy to come um, very soon we hope. And then finally, we also wanted to provide an update on the Environmental Accessibility Adaptations, or the EAA policy. So this is a service that's been on the waiver for quite some time, um, but we have actually really, um, re more recently, um, within the last year, actually had some completed projects with the EAA, so um, we're pretty happy about that, actually. So um, again, using those pilots to work out kind of some kinks in the policy and the provider provision that the um, provider has and um, it has gone through the policy work group and again will be updated or will be added to the uh, internet following today's webinar. Um, so as a reminder uh, what EAAR, um, EAAR adaptions to the private residence of the consumer or the consumer's family required by the consumer's care plan. They're necessary to ensure the health, welfare, and safety of the consumer, or they enable the consumer to function with greater independence in the home. Um, some environmental adaptation examples would include um, installing ramps, grab bars, widening of doorways, modifications to their bathroom, installation of some plumb electric or plumbing systems that are necessary to accommodate the medical equipment and supplies that are necessary for the welfare of the consumer. Um, so really just kind of home modifications to um, ensure that the home is accessible to the participant. So currently um, we still have ILC um, is the primary provider who has completed, I believe, all of the EAA projects that we have done at this time. Um, we do want to mention, though, that there are some situations where DM provi DME providers uh, might be willing to provide and install medical equipment. So for example, maybe a walk-in tub or a stair lift. Um, and typically, though these would need to be authorized as medical equipment because they wouldn't be enrolled as an actual EAA provider. Um, and so if you're con we would just ask that if you're considering authorizing any provider other than ILC for um, an EAA, please consult um, with myself, Misty, or Leslie uh, just to make sure that they're en enrolled correctly to provide the service um, and what service codes you should use and those types of things. We've had a couple issues pop up with um, providers that aren't necessarily um, enrolled to provide EA being authorized with that service code when um, we could have maybe authorized it uh, through medical equipment. So again, if you're considering an, what you think might be an EAA and it's with a provider other than ILC, please consult with Leslie or I. Any questions or comments? Okay, if not, we're going to turn it over to Jennifer and Jeanette, our Quality Assurance Specialist, to um, talk about the waiver review process. Okay, um, this is Jennifer Murray, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about the waiver review process. So historically, when we've had our quarterly waiver review um, webinars, we've gone over the results of our individual performance measures. And while we'll talk about that a little bit today, um, we thought we would just kind of step back and review the entire waiver review process just to give everybody a little broader picture of kind of what we do and why we do it. Um, so the, 
the process includes um, LTSS staff completing reviews on a monthly, quarterly, and yearly basis according to our HOPE waiver application. And those reviews are done by um, Jeanette and I, the supervisors split some of those reviews, Misty and Leslie do some of those reviews, it just depends on that performance measure. Um, remediations are completed as necessary to correct those cases that are, that are considered non-compliant. Um, and then quality assurance staff, so as you know, Jeanette Hansen and I are both um, quality assurance program specialists. Quarterly, we aggregate that data and compile results for um, discussion and review at our waiver review committee meetings. And so the, the waiver review committee is, um, it's a cross-section of, of state office staff, field staff, um, it includes two supervisors, Katie and Anna, um, um, two specialists, Carrie Retzer, Beth Hazing, and then um, Yvette, Beth, Misty, Leslie, Jennifer Gant, Michelle Hudicek, um, and Jeanette and I. So we meet quarterly to kind of um, discuss those, those scores and performance measures and take a look at areas where we need improvement. Um, we've talked a little bit, if you remember from prior webinars, our scores, that threshold of 86% is kind of a magic number for us. If we dip below that number or if we see um, any decline in other numbers, we really take a look at that and make recommendations for improvement um, and come up with some strategies um, based on those results. So that information is reported to CMS um, in several ways. The first one is an annual 372 report. And that is an annual report that's due to CMS in March of, of each waiver year. Um, and so our waiver years are, are aligned with the federal fiscal year. So that starts in October. So right now we are, we are reviewing today um, results from Q3, which would be April, May, and June of 2019. That's the results that we're looking at. Right now we're actually reviewing Q4, which is July, August, and September. And so some of you may be um, getting some questions from Jeanette and I about um, some current cases or some recent cases due to that. Um, so back to the 372, um, that is due to CMS in March of every year, like I said. Um, we report expenditures and um, verify cost effectiveness of the waiver. We also report on the status of our critical incidents, and that does include um, APS. And again, the 86% threshold, that's what I talked about a little bit as well. Um, and then we also report on those quality improvement strategies um, that we implement to try to increase our performance and get our scores up. Every third year, we are also required to submit an evidence report. And so um, that's the third year of each um, version or edition or, you know, of, of each of our waivers. And so right now that current evidence report is due on uh, December 31st of this year. So that is going to be taking a tremendous amount of our time as we try to get everything kind of buttoned up and, and um, reported accurately. So on the next slide is an example of what that um, evidence report looks like. Um, and CMS provides a template for what is required on this report. And not that any of you need to know this, but it's, it's hopefully interesting as you kind of see what we look at and um, score for each of our performance measures. As you can see on the bottom three sections, there's an analysis of, of that performance measure, any remediation or any issues that we've had in that area, and then the quality improvement activities, what we've done to make systemic changes or changes in policy and um, if that has improved the scores for that performance measure. Did I miss anything? Not sure. If so, let me know. No, I think that's administrative that authority. I'll just send it back to you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. This is Leslie. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the recommendations and updates that were made through the Waiver Review Committee meeting. Um, so the first one here is under the administrative authority performance measure and it's uh, regarding the exceptions policy and the waiver request for exceptions form. So um, this has been updated and will be um, 
shared after the webinar and updated on the internet, but the policy and form have been updated to remove the transfer ADL, which is no longer an ADL in the home care assessment. It was in the CHA, but it is not now. So we had to remove that from, from, the, from the policy and the form. So now the number of ADLs on the, on the form went from six to five, and the number of ADLs required um, for the exception uh, went from three to two. In addition, in the policy section, when to submit a waiver request exception uh, was updated to include uh, when, a, when you're going to purchase a, a one-time a one-time purchase that will result in the total cost of services exceeding the care plan maximum for that month, the purchase will occur. So really any time you go over the, the maximum care plan amount, you need to submit an exception request even if it's just for that one month. The total cost um, of the care plan maximum is $4,958.83 and that amount is located on the exception form itself. The other three reasons that you would submit uh, or times that you would submit uh, an exception request is during the initial assessment, if it's over the cost of services maximum, during the annual review, and then any time a current exception has an increase of $250 or more per month. So just a note too on the one-time purchase, we didn't really think that was a change, but recognized that it wasn't necessarily captured within the other reasons, so just wanted to add that. So again, I don't think it's a change, more of a clarification. Okay. Hey guys, it's Jeanette Hansen, and um, myself and Leslie and Michelle will be talking about the level of care recommendations and updates. Um, these are things that we discuss in our waiver review committee meetings. Um, so first we'll talk about um, when to submit a level of care determination request to the medical review team. Um, then we'll look at the medication administration in assisted living and then mental health certificate of medical necessity. So when to submit a level of care determination request to the medical review team. Um, the document, and we'll go through that, it will be shared and updated on the internet following the webinar. Um, updated it, we updated the form due to the implementation of the NRI home care assessment that um, is currently being used um, in Therap. And it is also updated to include the following under the other section. Um, when a current HOPE waiver participant transfers from other waiver services, so if they're on the in-home waiver and they transfer to the structured family caregiving services. So the form, I'll go over this uh, briefly. So the initial assessment, um, that has not necessarily changed. Uh, we still look at the less than $5,000 in resources um, that will likely meet the level of care criteria for the waiver. The home care assessment must include um, or indicate that there is a need for the following. Um, so daily nursing, assistance with activities of daily living, or weekly therapy. Um, and within that weekly therapy, the mental health therapy, uh, we will be going through that, um, how that has changed as far as uh, people qualifying just for that, under that category. So under each of those, you see the um, sections where you will find in the home care uh, assessment, uh, the sections you'll find where to find those. Um, within the uh, you submit a level of care at the annual review if the individual is a waiver participant or if a non-waiver LTSS consumer meet the criteria described under initial assessment above. And then other times that you would submit to the medical review team the level of care if there is a setting change. So if they're in an in-home waiver and they go to the hospital, then from the hospital they go to the nursing home for a short stay and then they return back to their home. Um, or the same if they're in assisted living, go to nursing home and back to assisted living. So just if there is that setting change, um, please submit to the medical review team the level of care. Um, if there is a current level of care is questionable, if you're hearing from a provider that uh, a uh, the 
person is not um, receiving personal cares, either they're refusing or they're able to do it on their own then. Um, so if you find at the six month review or um, whenever that may be that you're just questioning whether they're still eligible, you know, go ahead and sub, uh, complete the assessment and submit that to the medical review team. Uh, we receive a request from the economic assistance. Uh, Long-term care Medicaid application is pending, um, so then we submit one. Um, they will likely meet level of care criteria for the waiver, um, but they scored a uh, one or two on the South Dakota choices. Um, or if the specialist is uncertain, based on the above criteria, if the individual meets the level of care, I guess if any time you're in question or you're doubting or you're just not sure, just go ahead and submit it to the medical review team. Um, or, uh, of course, when a current HOPE waiver consumer is approved for structured family caregiving services by a structured family caregiving provider agency. This is Leslie again. Any questions about that before we move on? Once again, all of these forms and documents will be sent out to all of you after the webinar. So on the next slide, I um, want to talk a little bit about medication administration and assisted living. So on the home care assessment note regarding medications, it, it must indicate if the individual is receiving daily medication administration. Um, stating daily medication management is not sufficient because the MRT must be able to determine if the assisted living staff are, are simply managing the medications, so for example, picking up from the pharmacy, documenting the medications in the assisted living records, or setting up a pill bar, or if the assisted living staff are actually administering or dispensing the medications to the individual on a daily basis. So that's really, really important for the MRT staff to know. So um, we, we want to make sure that everybody understands that and notes that accordingly in the assessment. In addition to that, the, the note needs to indicate if the individual has an assessed need for daily medication administration. Um, so basically, we'd prefer the documentation, um, the specialist, if the specialist determines both apply would be that that individual has an assessed need for daily medication administration by assisted living staff. Um, on the assessed need, um, we need to make sure that they need their medication administrators administrated daily. Just simply receiving daily medication administration because the assisted living's policy is to provide it to everyone is not sufficient to meet waiver level of care criteria. To meet waiver criteria, daily medication administration by assisted living staff must be something that the person needs. So if the LTS specialist does not know if it's a need or if the individual is receiving it due to the assisted living policy, uh, the specialist can ask the assisted living for a copy of the most recent resident evaluation, which is required at admission, 30 days after the admission, and then annually thereafter. And that must include the medication administration needs um, of the individual. Or they could ask if there's a physician's order on file indicating that the person can self-administer their meds. Uh, sometimes this is also actually indicated on that resident evaluation. But basically, if they've been given a, a physician's order indicating they can self-administer their own meds, then medication administration would not be an assessed need for that person. So if you have any questions regarding a specific recipient, you can certainly contact uh, Ms. GRI um, regarding that person. Um, but I just wanted to share all that with you and let you know that all of this comes from the Department of Health Administrative Rule 4470. Um, and it's under basically medication administration um, in an assisted living. So as far as the mental health um, certificate of medical necessity, um, so this there's there's going to be a document and we'll go through that in the next slide, but the document will be shared and added to the internet following the webinar um, and it will be added to the LTSS provider page on the internet as well. Um, so it was created to obtain documentation of the assessed need for the provision of weekly mental health therapy. 
Um, so note that you only need to use this document if it's required if mental health therapy is the only waiver level of care criteria that the individual is likely to meet. So if you have an individual that is um, currently receiving personal cares and does have the um, weekly therapy, then you don't need to do it. So just know that only use it if, you're, if they are telling you that they are receiving weekly uh, mental health therapy. Um, it, this form must be in therapy document storage prior to the medical review team reviewing for level of care determination. Um, there has been a request for an updated listing of uh, community mental health agencies um, from behavioral health to include the phone number, fax, and email if available. Um, just want to ensure that when we are sending any type of document, um, as you all know of and probably practice, but just a reminder that when we're sending the um, community mental health agency via email, it must be sent securely through Voltage. So here is the form um, that will be completed. Um, so this form the uh, LTSS specialist you guys will initiate and you will fill out the individual's name, the date of birth, the Medicaid number, uh, your name, and um, that section above. And then you will send that to the licensed mental health professional and then they will complete the rest of the form. Um, you'll notice in the form, I'm not going to read it uh, verbatim to you, but you will notice that uh, we we strongly are saying that they, they need to have the um, mental health services conducted by a licensed mental health professional, um, excluding any type of case management. Um, you will see that excluding case management verbiage in there um, a couple of different times uh, just because I think that has been a question and a concern that has been brought forward by specialists um, on what specifically are we looking for. Um, so this I think is going to be an excellent tool for specialists to have uh, where after you do an assessment of an individual and they say that they are getting this weekly therapy, you can send this to uh, the person that they are saying is providing that support to them. And then it is up to that um, licensed mental health professional to complete the form. Um, and then they will actually sign it and then they will fax it to um, uh, Angel um, in the Hillsview uh, office in Pierre. Um, so she will take care of that. Uh, once she receives it, she'll scan the document into Therap document storage and she'll notify the LTSS specialist, she'll notify you guys when it's completed. Um, the reason why we looked at having um, the form sent to Angel is it's just easier to have one form for all offices rather than creating one for each of the offices um, and also easier for counseling staff to just have one consistent fax number. Um, so hopefully with this process, it will help the specialists, it will help you guys out, you know, when you're questioning, you know, the mental health part of things and if they're actually receiving that type of service. Um, send this form out, they'll complete it, send it to Angel, she'll let you know, and then you can um, scan that into uh, Therap document storage and um, submit it to MRT and then go from there. Is there any questions in regards to the mental health certificate of medical necessity or the medication administration in um, assisted livings? This is Misty. I just did want to make a quick clarification and you'll notice this on the health certificate. It does have language in there, but um, the license therapy can be also um, performed by someone under the direct supervision of a licensed mental health professional. Um, and that is on the form, but I just wanted to make that clarification. It just can't be case management. We do have a question in the Q&A. It says, is the daily medication administration the only way a person can qualify for assisted living waiver? If they self-administer, can they still get Medicaid rate for assisted living, and do we still manage that? Um, so they can still qualify under any of the three criteria so they can have um, the need for personal care assistance or um, the, the need for some other daily nursing or um, the, the therapy requirement as well. Um, if for some reason they're not eligible they would be, cons um, so if they do self-administer and that's the only criteria so they don't need assistance with their personal care and they don't have weekly therapy so they would be self-care. Um, they would move to private pay. We would not manage that and we would 
not um, have anything to do with the Medicaid rate. The only other potential, they could still get the Medicaid um, regular AL if they did qualify for, for that, but it's a um, different rate and we still wouldn't manage it. Uh, okay, we have another question. It says, is dementia, or in other words, memory care unit, a qualifier for our ALW? Um, I'm not sure I 100% understand that question, but again, they have to meet one of the three criteria. Um, I think Michelle and I were just discussing this. A lot of times people with dementia have deficits in ADLs, and so they still wind up qualifying under the, the qualifications for assistance with personal care. Mm -hmm. And I don't, um, Michelle, do you want to speak to, not to put you on the spot, but do you want to speak to maybe what they're referring to here is the, not the hands-on assistant for personal care, but with some of the cognitive um, deficits where we would approve um, a level of care? For yeah, waiver. so if somebody, if somebody needed um, just supervision and cueing um, for their personal care, um, and they have a diagnosis of dementia, or um, you can, you can, tell by the medical documentation that they have a cognitive deficit, um, then we can accept that diagnosis along with the fact that they need supervision or cueing and we can qualify them that way. So it doesn't necessarily have to be hands-on physical assistance for those people with dementia. Okay, another question in the Q&A says, did you say that the LTSS specialist would send this out but it will be returned to ANGEL? Yes, that is correct. You, you, would, you would complete the, up, the top part of the form and fax or email it to the mental health agency and then they would return it back to the peer office. And we did that for a couple of reasons. One, so that we didn't have, you know, a, a version of this form for every office um, with it being on letterhead. And two, we really thought that it would be way more convenient for the community mental health providers to just have one fax <laughs> number. You know, one community mental health provider might provide service to several of our offices, so we just wanted it to be one number. And then on the, will there be a cover sheet to accompany this form? I hadn't thought of that. So, um, yeah, we will create something like that. I think because they, they, all the fax cover sheets and all the offices have the, have the letterhead, right? It would be good for them to know where to send it to, and so they, if we supplied a cover sheet that had the number already populated on there and right. instead of what it was, I, I think we could that's, do that. Yeah, I think that's pretty easy. Well, uh, I'll, I'll get that done before I, I send all of this out so that can accompany the form. Um, okay, second question, is the mental health certificate required for HOPE waiver only, or is it used for in-home services too? Um, I, I think there may have been um, maybe some current conversations about eligibility that are going on within the policy work group, and I, I think there are some um, potential situations where this would be utilized, but um, we will provide further direction on that, or that will be provided once the... Uh, this conversation was pretty specific to the level of care requirement mm -hmm. for waiver eligibility, but we have been in the policy work group and talking about what constitutes the need for services and eligibility. So, yeah, more to come on that. Are there any other questions before we move on? Um, just one more thing. I just want to make sure that everybody understands that when Angel receives a mental health certificate, a completed form um, here at Hillsview, she will scan that form into the document storage for that individual in therapy and then email the specialist that it's been completed. So I just want to make sure that everybody understood that um, you'll be notified as soon as, as we receive it here at the office and get it scanned in the therapy. 
Okay, we do have another question. If a specialist knows that a consumer is only receiving case management, do we still send out the certificate? Depending on whether or not that's their only qualifier. Yeah, I think that's going to depend on a couple of things. Is is mental health um, therapy the only reason that they would be meeting the eligibility criteria for waiver? And yes, okay. Um, I, I think again, that's kind of going to be a case by case. I I probably would if you think that there's going to be any issues with that, um, just so we we have documentation on file that that's the situation. And I would send it too because if it was directed by, as you mentioned earlier, a licensed professional receiving therapy, you'd want them to make that call. Yeah, the licensed licensed uh, mental health professional is is marking this form and documenting that that individual is getting weekly um, skilled mental health services um, and it's not case management, I, I, I don't know how we, how we would not provide those services and I would hope that any licensed professional wouldn't complete it if they weren't receiving those services. So, right. I just think we want, we want them to say if it's... Yeah. yeah. Are we asking them to do that? whenever they think of it or at review time? Um, I think this should be collected at the time of the review or any time a level of care is requested. Um, yep. If there's situations that I guess you're concerned about at this time where you know that they might um, fall under this, you could potentially go through the process. Yeah, uh, yeah as a reminder, if, if this is the only reason a person is going to qualify, it has to be scanned into document storage and therapy before the MRT request, MRT review is completed because they'll want to see that to make that determination. Okay, I don't see any other questions, so we're going to go on to uh, the service plan recommendations and updates. Excuse me, Leslie, uh, there are two more questions in there. Oh. Oh, yeah, we have I'm, our I'm, 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 I missed mm -hmm. them here. Hold on. Sorry. Thanks, Jeanette. Yeah. Okay. So the first one is weekly chemical dependency counseling considered skilled mental health services. Again, I think that we would direct we would have the form completed and leave that up to the the entity to determine. And the second, is there an exception of the special or an expectation of the specialist to follow up with the mental health agency if they are not getting notification from ANGEL? If so, how long do we give them before we make contact to see if it's been completed? Um, I don't think that that's, some, that's not necessarily something we've discussed, so I think we could discuss that further, but I think generally if there's an issue in getting it that we would follow up. But we'll We'll further determine if we need to make some timelines. Well, and we have, you know, talked to Angel about this, and and I believe that it it it. it that will happen pretty quickly. Yeah, she'll do it right away as soon as we receive it. Delays 